energy up. Let's do this. It'll yes. be great. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cosplay Crunch. Each week, we sit down to talk about all things cosplay, including personal experiences, useful tips and advice, horror stories and hot takes, and sometimes the latest news and drama. I am your host, Zavage Cosplay, and this week on the podcast, we have the lovely, talented, and beautifully stunning Kadia Kawaii, aka Lisa, aka Kadia, aka tattoo artist, <laughs> former, aka artist current, um, and I guess technically ex cosplayer, but maybe we'll all change soon. Mm-hmm. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me onto your show. I have loved listening to every single episode so far. Like, I've been on the edge of my seat, just so excited to see what everyone has had to share. And it's it's been wonderful so far. It's definitely been an experience and a time. I don't know that I would call it wonderful, but those are your words, not mine. And I will take it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, no, I'm so happy you're here, too, because... I know, like, I've said this a few times, but when I was putting together the first season, I definitely wanted to get a variety of experiences and people. And when I was also thinking of the way that this podcast would be structured, I wanted to make sure that I didn't just have um, cosplayers. I mean, obviously, we're going to go into your cosplay background, but I wanted to also have photographers, artists. Like, I wanted to have, like, different facets of the convention scene community be represented because everyone has different uh i guess perspectives and yours is one that i definitely want to hear about that's why i knew i knew you had to be on here well thank you so much for thinking about me because when i heard you were doing a cosplay con uh, a cosplay podcast i thought oh it's gonna be all cosplayers but whenever you reached out to me i i was so thrilled that I was, you even yeah. thought of me no you, you literally came to mind first but also okay I want to start at the beginning. I really don't remember how we met. Do you? <laughs> okay, I'm I'm going to be honest. I don't remember either, but I think it was Onicon during the huge Sailor Moon photo shoot on the beach. <gasps> was that it? I think it was because at the time I had just known Carol for maybe half a year just through social media okay and i am pretty sure she introduced uh me to you during the photo shoot okay so it was the the one group i think that was actually complete for my whole life where we actually had every single one of the senshi except for chibi moon which is whatever and mm-hmm. i was texting a mask and we had everyone which is wild because that never happens I know. And it was it was actually insane to have everybody there too. And everyone was so nice and all their cosplays looked one, like really good, very yeah. polished, and the photos turned out really great. Well, mine was polished because I bought it. Um no <laughs> <laughs> So that. I literally bought it. No, because I remember uh they wanted to do this group and um I was like, well, I don't want to make tuxedo masks. So I was like, how can I buy this? That actually is one of the only cosplays I ever bought that fit me properly. And then also I made, I just made the mask. That's literally it. Um, mm-hmm. And then I wore it at one time. And then I think I literally got rid of it after that. So it's literally gone to some other home at this point. But yeah, that, if that was the time we met, that's wild. I don't even remember what year that was. That was like maybe like 2017. Oh man, maybe even 2016. It's, it's been ago. a hot minute. Yeah. Do you still have your cosplay? Do you still have Mars? No, no, I do not. And actually, <laughs> same thing. I actually bought that cosplay secondhand from somebody else. Oh, really? <laughs> so I could be a part of the photo shoot. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, so... honestly, that was honestly <laughs> slay, that photo shoot. And then I remember like when that, that picture, we were like on the cover of like whatever, like online, like Long took that picture. And oh, I think it was on uh, Kotaku. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like mm-hmm. the, the cosplay group that will never happen again in eternity, probably because, yeah. Well, it happened that one year at, uh, I guess, at what's it called? Acon that we talked about on the previous episode, but we won't bring that up oh, again. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Just very briefly, very briefly, um, I wanted to share that the year the Sailor Moon group won Best in Show at Akon, uh, 
I had also entered that contest and placed third in masters. Um, and then uh, the next year for ACON, I was invited back to help judge the hall contest. And that was the year with the disgusting hotel. <gasps> Wait, and you were with, in that hotel room with me, right? Yes, with okay, you, right. Owl and Coffee, and Vivera. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. It's all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. The web we weave. <laughs> um, okay, well, that makes sense. But okay, so going back even further, how did you first get into going to conventions? And did you start cosplaying from the get go? Or did you kind of like start going to cons and then learn about cosplay and then start slowly cosplaying? So um, the first time I heard about cosplay was from reading Shoujo Beat magazine when I was in middle school, um, which it was a, a, a manga magazine uh, geared towards young females. Um, and it would include makeup tutorials, cosplay tutorials, uh, convention pictures, and little snippets of manga from the shoujo company. Where did you buy um, the magazine from? At Barnes & Noble. Really? Yes, they had them. Uh, but it was a very short run. Uh, it only lasted a couple years from, like, I actually looked it up because I had a, a war flashback to this magazine. Um, the magazine existed from 2005 until 2009. Oh, okay. So gotcha. during that period. It was very brief, but she was beautiful. Do you still have any of them? I do not. Oh. Because I was a little gremlin, and I would draw and like color in the manga panels and like, oh. cut out all the gorgeous pictures that were in there. Because a lot of the features were of manga covers and manga art. Uh -huh. which I was super obsessed with. But I found out about cosplay and conventions through that. But I didn't actually go to a convention until I was 19. And okay. I went to San Japan in 2013. That was your first one. Mm -hmm. That's honestly such a good convention to start with. Because it's one, well run. Two, uh, not too huge, but not small. It's in a great mm -hmm. location. Like, you picked a really good one. How did you pick San Japan? You weren't in San Antonio, were you? No. Um, I went to school at University of Houston. And it was during the summer when I really didn't have anything to do. And I thought, well, maybe I could at least try to go to a convention and see if I like it. And so I made a cosplay that summer. I made a son from Princess Mononoke. Uh all from scratch. <laughs> oh, Slay. That was your first one? Yes. Yes. It, it looked okay. I mean, it was the first try, one? you know. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I think most no, people don't apart. have their first... It fell apart. Yeah. I feel like yes. most people don't have their first costumes because they fall, fell apart. Or they were, like, so bad they went in the dumpster. <laughs> yes. She's she's long deceased. But, um... So I wore San from Princess Mononoke to my first convention and at the time, I didn't know anybody else that went to conventions or really liked anime. So I drove to San Antonio that Saturday morning of San Japan. I was there probably five or six hours, and then I drove back home. Wait, from Houston? <laughs> yes. That's psychopath behavior. Also, I was poor as fuck. I had no money for a hotel. I'm like, I can barely afford the gas and the badge. So this is, this is what it's going to be. Oh my god, wait, so you didn't only stay for five hours because you didn't know anyone. It was more of like a, oh, I can't stay the night, so I can't stay here, but I, ha I have to leave. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. But I went to panels, I was in the dealers and artists room, uh, I was observing all the different cosplay, and it was, it was like I had found my happy place. Uh -huh. Those were the most blissful five hours of my entire life. <laughs> Just hours. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So I think most people, me, myself included, would be like intimidated to just go to a convention by myself for the first time and just like exist. Was that like scary? Um, it was a little scary, but I was also on such an adrenaline rush for the entire day. It felt like I was on crack all day with how hype I was. I was so excited. Oh and God. everyone is so nice at conventions, too. People would just come up and say hi and ask to take pictures with me. And I would just talk to complete strangers, like, all throughout the day while I did my own thing. 
That's until true. I was oh, ready well. to go home. I guess that since you were in a cosplay, it's an icebreaker already. It like makes it easier that way. Um, mm-hmm. I know you said 2013. My first was actually also 2013, and it was OniCon, uh, which was Aww. I literally went because my friend like uh, well actually for two reasons. My friend had told me, oh, there's a thing in Galveston where people dress up as characters, and it was on it was on Halloween, so I thought it was like a Halloween like thing and it was not a halloween thing and then mm-hmm. i had a friend that also had a beach house that was like there so we just stayed there and we would like drive to onicon from the beach house um but i think that like i had at least had like i think i had like a buddy each time i had at least one or two people with me so but also onicon is like the size of like a school gymnasium so like it's not like i, I would i was gonna be overwhelmed or like intimidated anyway but Mm-hmm. either way that's crazy though so you drove to san japan were there for six hours and then you tailed it back home and you were like oh my god that was wild and then what was your like the next one you went to after that i went to onicon that same year nice wait mm-hmm. that means that you were at my first convention and i was also wearing the princess mononoke cosplay to that one too she hadn't fallen apart just yet Okay, she was still hanging on by a thread. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I looked pretty scroungy because um, most of the clothing I had thrifted mm. and turned into the costume. So I made alterations. And in my head, I thought, oh, well, this character lives in the forest. I'm going to rub dirt all over it. And she also wouldn't wear makeup either. So I'm not going to wear any makeup or a wig. So I just showed up looking real scraggly. I'll tell you that. Wait, that's honestly iconic. It's like, oh, well, this character. Okay, okay, you see that in like shows and everything, right? You're like watching, I don't know, like The Last of Us. And they have like their freaking lashes on, 301s, top bottoms, blush, eyeliner. They have their lip liner, lipstick. And I'm like... You're literally fighting for your life in the woods in a post post apocalyptic world. Why do you make up on? And so you were like, "Yeah, Sam wouldn't have makeup on. She lives in the jungle with animals. I'm just not." Mm-hmm. And you're like, "Also, she doesn't know what a wig is. She doesn't have Arda, so we're just not doing that either." Arda didn't exist yet in that universe, so it's canon. <laughs> and- and then when they make the remake, she's going to be having her different wigs for every fight that she's in. All the little monkeys are going to have wigs. <laughs> Please. Um, okay, so that's funny. We might have run into each other there, although probably not. I didn't, didn't talk to anyone. I was so overwhelmed. But, um, um, and- I'm going to say I, I hope you didn't see me just because of the circumstances. <laughs> me? Oh, no, 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 no. You, if you would have saw me, you'd have been like, that person came out of like a horror film or something like i was so i literally i was like you you want to know okay you thought not wearing a wig was bad imagine spray painting your hair neon orange and using like styling gel to spike it up in the air and be like oh this is an adequate substitute for a wig i'm feeling my fry futurama fantasy that was me in my little red windbreaker, my Levi jeans, and my nasty, crusty, dusty Cheeto hair. Like, yeah. You actually cosplayed as Fry? Yes. Oh my God. That's so wholesome, though. It was so bad. It was so, I, like, I feel like I should remake it, like, now that, well, I said now that I can do wigs, I would get the fucking wig commission because I cannot. Mm-hmm. But I would, like, redo it now. And, like, I think it could actually make it look good. Um, but that's not a top priority, but that's, yeah, you, you, I, I wish you would have looked like a freaking master's level costume competitor compared to my little nasty rug rat looking monster self. I think I do have a picture somewhere that I could scrounge up for you. Oh my if God. If you ever want to see. Please do. I love seeing the pictures after the episode. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Please find it if you can. I'll yes. send you one of me looking horrible. Um, I look very greasy. <laughs> I'll say that much. I want to talk about, so yeah, the cosplay journey that led into actually competing in contests because you made some beautiful award-winning costumes. I remember the first thing that comes to mind was when you did the, like the, um, I think it's Sakizo Seraphim. Oh, yes. Yeah, that one is, like, imprinted in my head because of how beautiful that was. Like, I don't know. Maybe not that costume specifically, but, like, how did you start 
what I guess pushed you towards making these like really big projects and then doing these contests? Well, after I made my first cosplay, I, I just thought I had so much fun making it Mm -hmm. that I really wanted to do other projects like that. And so the first year that I cosplayed, I basically just learned how to sew, how to do little props. uh, And I kind of fiddled with Warbla to make armor Mm -hmm. because that was becoming really hot around that era. Yeah, it was. Uh, People finding out about EVA foam and Warbla. Um, So my first cosplays were very, like, on the simple side, like, Raven from Teen Titans, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And the more I cosplayed and gained skills, the higher difficulty of cosplay I wanted to create. Mm -hmm. So the years following that, I just kept practicing, sewing, making cosplays here and there, and... Eventually, I made a piece that I felt comfortable competing with. What was that? Um, um, so the first cosplay I competed with was Red from a, an indie game called Transistor. Okay. And at the time, I was taking architecture classes in college. So I knew how to create vector files and uh, use laser cutters. Ooh. So... I, this this video game character has this huge light up see through plexiglass sword, and it kind of started with making the sword um, using the vector files, the laser cutter, and uh, so I put the sword together using all of those things that I had learned how to do, and I also created a light switch to go inside of it because I had learned how to solder uh, as well. Oh my god! And I really liked I liked how it turned out, um, and so I decided to make the rest of the cosplay. And I thought, you know, this is okay. I could enter <laughs> a contest with it. And so that year, I decided I would enter into anime mod series cosplay contest. <laughs> it's this so was funny. This in 2015. <laughs> it's so funny because I feel like the common thread. Okay, so albeit everyone up to this point has been a cosplayer from Texas, that's actually changing for the, like, the rest of the season. There's going to be more people from other places. But the common thread, I feel like, with all of these people that have been on the show is uh, some connection to anime mod series at some point, which is understandable. Yes. <laughs> Yes, like pretty much everyone on your podcast so far has said, "Oh yeah, I was at Anime Matsuri." <laughs> mm-hmm. No, literally. So, hey, yeah. so you competed at Anime Matsuri 2015. That was your first contest, and it wasn't necessarily you were making a costume to enter into a contest. It was more so of a, "Oh, I've gotten good enough at this point to where I don't feel like a potato sack entering this work." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. And really, the sword, it was mostly like a passion project because I enjoyed the video game and I really wanted a real life one. So after making that, the rest of the cosplay came around eventually. Um, But yes, I entered Anime Matsuri in the novice category. And I was really shocked because I got first place in novice. And I won a craftsmanship award. I'm not from, surprised uh, based on what you just said. <laughs> like, and I think of a not like when a novice entered in with like a LED lit up like plexiglass cut like vectored like giant sword, and then was like, "Oh, here I'm a novice." I'd be like, "What's happened?" That, you were you were the novice of 2020 like 2024 back in 2015. Oh my god, that's <laughs> so funny. But um, I remember during the pre judging. Um, Specifically, uh, Vulpin Props was one of the judges. I don't know if you've heard of him, but I I love his work. Oh, yeah. Um, And at the time, he was making a prop from one of the studio's other video games that they had made. And so he was asking me all kinds of questions about how I had made it, uh, where I got all my references, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then about half a year after the contest, he made his own Oh, inspo you were the inspiration and and he was like touching it asked to hold it flipped it all over just inspecting it and i was honestly i honestly wanted to piss myself because i really admired his work oh, and yeah. i thought oh my god he is 
tearing it apart right now. No. That wasn't the case. Right. Um, and he was very nice. And he was the judge that I got the craftsmanship award from. That is so, so awesome. Oh my God. I I that was really cool. Yeah. I can't believe like your first contest, not only did you win, but you got a award from someone you admire so much. That's like incredible. I, I know that like I got a uh, armor award or it wasn't just me. It was also like Carol and Megan got the armor award from Kamui. And that was like <gasps> wild to me. Yes. But, um, that's, that's crazy. So, okay. You started off strong and then when did you what was like you did a lot of big builds i know you did like uh demon hunter from diablo 3 you did like the seraphim i mentioned before oh mm -hmm. you did like a unicorn night what was that from mm -hmm. oh that one was also a sakizo art piece okay mm -hmm. that was beautiful and then did you ever enter like the uh japanese festival of houston's costume contest oh Yes, I did. I did. I entered with Demon Hunt, the Demon Hunter one that I had made. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Did you win? And yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was, I was really like... shocked about because uh, at this point I had made a lot of cosplay friends uh, in the Houston community, and a handful of my very talented cosplay friends had entered, and I just showed up. I didn't think I would win. Uh, I mostly just went with a good attitude, like, oh, I'll see what happens. And right. I'm here to have fun. And then it turns out uh, I got first place. And the, which is actually insane to think about, the award oh, yeah. along with the trophy was a trip to Japan. That's the thing. So for anyone that doesn't know, who's not from Houston, um, they have a Japanese festival annually that's not like an anime convention. It's just a Japanese culture, like space outside in a park in Houston. And I think it might, is it two days or one day? It's two days. I think two days, yeah. And then on one of the days they have, they have a stage, like performances and stuff. One of the days they have a costume contest. And what people didn't know because everyone thinks oh like i want to go enter a costume contest at like an anime convention or a comic con this was not very publicized but people that knew like knew and um yeah when you in that contest the first prize was a trip to japan okay so did they like i know the flights were included right and it was for two people Yes, yeah, so I went with my boyfriend at the time, now husband. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. like, so, like, that's wild. They include, like, what, did you, did they plan the trip? And then you, like, how did that work? So they provided us with two round-trip uh, flight vouchers, and they let us choose the dates and how long we were going to stay. Gotcha. And then you planned everything else yourself? Mm-hmm. That's wild. And Yes. And actually being in Japan, it's everything is so ridiculously cheap that Oh yeah. The, I mean, the flight covered almost all of the expenses. But it's That's... insane to even think that that happened. I know. Like it's some a... kind of fever dream. <laughs> Do they still have that con like does the contest still exist? I don't think so. Um I remember a few years ago, um they had made a post on Facebook, I believe, that they were still having the contest, but they weren't doing the round trip prize anymore. So I don't, I don't know if that changed or not. I in missed recent my years. shot. Now that I'm like fine. Now that now in 2024 that I could finally maybe have a chance, it's like gone. Although I think it probably went away a long, a long time ago because I haven't heard mm -hmm. anyone winning that um, in the past years. Yes, and I know it was a really big deal for several years because whenever a, a cosplayer would win the contest like everyone in the cosplay community saw it or posted about it or commented on a post like everybody knew mm -hmm. who was going to japan that year right oh man that's so wild okay um so you that was your demon hunter and then uh about when what year or like what like marked the last costume that you made. What was the last costume you made, actually? So the last costume that I made, it was Crusader from Diablo 3. Or, yeah. I don't know if I... I I'm sure I've seen this, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. what, when was that, um, do you remember? That was in 2017. 
Yes. It's been that long. I know. It has been a long time. You could have told me it was 2019 or 2020 and I would have believed you. Because I feel like I knew that you had not made or cosplayed since before COVID. But I didn't Mm -hmm. know that the last costume you made was 2017. That's crazy. So you literally went balls to the wall and like made all these giant projects in such a relatively like short time frame in the grand scheme of things. Because if you're saying like Transistor was your first contest, that was 2015. And 2017 was your Crusader, which was your last costume. And in that span of time, you made at least three to four like master's level show-stopping costumes how like what was that so when i was in college i i had the curse of being extremely introverted and i lived on campus Uh so in between classes all i would do was make cosplay or watch anime or play video games that's all or do all at the same time Mm, yep (laughs) oh my god Yes, there was one cosplay. Um, there was one cosplay I had made. It was an armor version of Sailor Moon, and I just watched the entirety of the '90s Sailor Moon series in in the just having it on in the background while making this cosplay. <laughs> so that's all I did. Oh my god! But it was very fulfilling because I had a lot of friends online that were into cosplay or J fashion Mm -hmm. that I could check in with or see their progress or just message them. Right. Um, And then actually going to the cons, actually going to the cons was so, that's what made it so worth it. Getting to be there and seeing all these people I had met and wearing the fruits of my labor. Yeah. That's, it's just, that's just so crazy. Cause I, I guess my whole perception of time was warped severely because I literally did not, even think that 2017 was last time so okay so that was your last costume was there like a reason or a pivotal moment to which you were like oh i like did you have a conscious decision to be like this is my last costume i'm gonna make for like the foreseeable future or was it more of like it kind of just like fell away or like what happened there so um my hiatus if you will so i had graduated from college in fall of 2016 and I moved into my parents' house Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much where I made the crusader cosplay at my parents' house. Um, But later that year, Hurricane Harvey happened Mm -hmm. and my parents' house flooded six feet in. So I lost all of my cosplays. Oh my God. Wait. Which... Wait, wait, wait. So the oh. earlier when I was like, oh, do you still have that costume? You're like, no, it's gone. I'm like, oh. No, she's dingy. <laughs> she's long gone in the dumpster. Oh, my God. From wait. Harvey. Wait. Oh, my God. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. So, all, oh, my God. That's so awful. All your co- – well, let alone their whole fucking house, right? But, like, all your costumes got, like, completely destroyed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Pretty much every single one, because at the time I was living in moving boxes. So all of my cosplays were in cardboard boxes, just spread her out mm-hmm. uh, on the floor in, in my room. And so when the rain and just came in and it flooded, I mean, every single box was completely soaked, completely ruined, like basically unwearable or fixable. So at that point, I felt pretty defeated oh really um <laughs> i can't imagine that oh my god at the same time all of my tools uh were also ruined like oh. all of my dremels uh all well, just every every material uh was destroyed pretty much um and at the same time i had just started my first adult job so i had no time to oh. recreate them or really get into anything new so that's pretty much why i stopped cosplaying (laughs) that'll that'll do it jesus christ do it all your cosplay tools and costumes gone and then oh here now go start working and it's like when are you gonna how so have you have you made or like sewn anything since then up to now or do you even have a sewing machine right now or no um do you have a sewing machine um and 
So for the last couple of cons I've been at, I've just thrown together a really shitty, cheesy cosplay, like Lord Farquaad or the Once yes. from the Lorax. Okay, just maybe fun. maybe that's why I thought you had cosplayed more recently because I saw those and I'm like, my my brain is like mush and I'm like, oh no, it couldn't have been that long ago. That was the last time you made a serious costume, and then up to now, it's been like kind of like fun, like thrown together. And then, Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, mostly, I think I have trauma from Harvey, like, Mm -hmm. unironically, because whenever I have been sewing things, just for fun, just quick little fun things, that thought kind of crosses my head, like, this isn't replaceable. So I'm like, oh, well, I don't want to get too invested in it. Just in no. case. No. Oh my god, know? that's so sad. Oh my god, that's so sad. I didn't think about. Oh my god. I mean, okay. I've never lost anything it's like okay. devastating <laughs> in like a flood or like a natural disaster or anything like that. Um, but like, I can't believe that. Like, I mean, I guess it makes sense because all your stuff was gone and you didn't have any control over it. But like, oh my god. Like, if you're sewing something, like, oh well, I don't want to like take be too precious with it because you know another hurricane could come. <laughs> It's not Harvey's son might come around for round two. Not the spawn, the spawn of Harvey. <laughs> oh my god! At, at least it's a little bit funny now. At oh my least god. I can laugh. <laughs> I'm glad you can laugh because I'm like, oh my god, that's so sad. Like, okay, so I don't know about. Well, okay, I know the people that were affected by Hurricane Harvey. The only other cosplayer I know that had costumes that were damaged uh, was Carol. Um, yes, I remember. And, like, yeah, some of her costumes were damaged completely and like threw away, and some of her Lolita dresses that were really expensive mm-hmm. were like stained. But the one mm-hmm. thing that I will always make fun of her for, and maybe it's in bad taste because you know she went through all that, but I will still make fun of her. She had a lot of wigs, and she had like an army locker trunk full of wigs. Like she probably had no less than probably like a hundred wigs in this trunk, and. When Harvey came, all the wigs got like swampified, and she was like, "Yeah, going through like the rubble of like the house they were in, and like you know dealing with all that." And so she was just taking these like rat nest wigs and like throwing them into a trash bag, and she had like a like hefty lawn bag full of rat wigs, (laughs) and then I think at some point like she like like hung them up to dry and like they dried out but they were all tangled little rat nests and then she just like threw them back in the bag again and so for like a long time she had a hefty lawn-sized bag full of rat nest wigs and that was carol no and that literally was like what harvey did and i was like at least you only had rat wigs like all your stuff was all gone like at least like her like sewing machine like some of her costumes survived but yeah that's crazy. That was the year I went to San Japan, actually, and um, did Naruto. And I think I might have talked about this before, but, like, that was all – the entire group fell apart because everyone was affected by Harvey or – Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I, I heard you mention that in a previous episode. Yeah. And that, 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 I was in college station, so I was like, I'm having a great time um, working on my cosplays. And everyone else was like, I'm drowning. Not fun. Um, You're okay. literally dying. No, literally. Okay. So putting back the cosplay and kind of like, okay, you went through that journey, that evolution. You had like the highs and then obviously the low of like losing everything. Um, how did you get into becoming an artist and like tabling as an artist at Artist Alleys? And I know some of that was like potentially a tattoo evolution into that. So I want you to talk about mm-hmm. your tattoo journey and then I want to like, how did that lead into, I guess, being an artist? Mm-hmm. So my first job out of college, I was a special education teacher. And I very quickly realized that I didn't like it. It was not a good fit for me. Um, not because of the kids, but mostly the politics involving uh, Texas schools and the education system. Oh, yeah. And I also missed the the crafting of cosplay, like working with my hands to create something. Mm -hmm. And at the time I had just recently gotten my first tattoo ever. And the artist was a female. What was it? And Oh, it was, um, 
The Last Unicorn. Uh, it's an old movie from the 80s. It's an animated yeah. film. Um, but just the experience of getting that first tattoo and talking to this amazing, talented woman about her tattooing career, it was very inspiring. And so the teaching job, that ended in 2018. And I decided in 2019, I was going to work on an art portfolio. Okay. And present it to a tattoo studio to try to get in, get an apprenticeship. And so I spent half the year drawing and showed up to some, a couple of tattoo shops just to present my portfolio to see if they'd be interested in taking me on uh, or not. And it's very hard to get an apprenticeship. Oh, really? And yes, it is very competitive. Um, so the first few times I went to shops in my area, I got rejected. Uh -huh. And that just made me want to work even harder to get accepted. Um, so I worked on my portfolio uh, two or three months more and returned to the shops that I had been to previously. And I finally got an approval. And that's when I started my tattoo journey. Oh my gosh. Wait, so I know, I know what kind of art you do because obviously I've... I been uh observer this whole time but like for anyone that doesn't know what kind of like art were you making for those months leading up to uh applying i guess to be an apprentice like what type of art or like genre and everything um well i really like cartoons so bubbly colorful cartoon pieces were what filled up my portfolio and then later on that's kind of the style that i went on to tattoo mm-hmm and then, so you went and you uh, showed your portfolio. I didn't actually know that's how that worked. I didn't know that's how you got a, a I, I actually had no idea how anyone became a tattoo artist. I never thought about mm -hmm. that hard. I was just kind of like, oh, they're there. They're doing tattoos. <laughs> yes. It kind of, um, it sucks a little bit trying to get into the industry, uh, mostly because it's very heavily male oriented. So mm -hmm. being a young female working directly under and apprenticing for a guy was very intimidating at first. Um, but it was fine once I got into the groove of things and got to really know who I was working with. Just like, I mean, really just like any other job. You have to get sure. used to it. But the apprenticeships, they're, you either have to pay up front to be taught how to tattoo or you work for free. Oh. And I chose to work for free for an entire year whoa that's mm -hmm. wild that's also like yes. a really big like not only is that like a lot of effort and work because i can't imagine like how like how much how hard it is to learn how to tattoo but also like the financial obligations of not being able to have income from that for a year that's a lot mm -hmm. yes but thankfully I, I had some savings from my teaching job to help mm -hmm. get me through that time and also inflation wasn't such a bitch like it is now oh i know so it was pretty it was easier to get by at the time yeah so you how long so you, a year of like basically being an unpaid intern but like an apprentice mm -hmm. And then um, throughout that time, were you doing mostly your own designs or were you getting designs from clients or was it like a mix of both? So the apprenticeship is learning how to run a tattoo shop, how to clean all of the supplies, the materials, the machines, uh, learning how to build and run machines and practicing your art style oh. and essentially doing all kinds of errands for the other established tattoo artists gotcha okay yeah so like how mm -hmm. did you practice i guess like when was the first time you actually like put pen to paper and like tattooed someone or like how did that how did you get there so about seven months in i was able to get my first machine and then some plastic sheets of fake skin is what it's called and i practiced on those for many many months uh probably five months until I was allowed to tattoo something very, very small on somebody. Oh my God. This cosplay is nothing compared to this girl. Like you want to talk, you want to talk about Warbla. No, let's talk about like tattooing someone. This is a lot. This is like, it was the time frame here. Like, okay. So we have like at least six to eight months of like building a portfolio. Then we have like, eight months to a year of like just being an apprentice and then mm -hmm. so that's already like almost like almost two years 
And Mm -hmm. then you have your starting to like practice. So like it was pretty much like two years before from start of this journey to like actually tattooing someone's skin, right? Yes, it really was a long time when you put it like that. Isn't that like an associate's degree? Just about. I I feel like that is. Yeah, that's crazy. Oh my God. And it's it's an associate's degree built off of slave labor. (laughs) (laughs) Put that on a t-shirt. Yay! (laughs) Um, Oh my God, that's crazy. Okay, so... um, you finally, so what, I guess what would that, what would like 2019 is when you started like actually doing tattoo work and taking clients? Yeah. So 2020, G- literally January 1st, 2020 was when I was allowed to. No. Mm-hmm. So you had three months of like working on clients. Well, I guess. Okay. So at least in Texas, you probably, I guess, how did the, how did the pandemic affect that? Cause I know like some places like shut down for like maybe a, like a month or so, but then like, as long as you were wearing like a mask, you could still do tattoos. Like, or I'm assuming like, were you able to work through 2020 or were you like, how did that happen? So I had been tattooing about two and a half months uh, until the middle of March when all of the mandates started passing that shops had to close or mm-hmm. wear masks and funny enough tattoo shops were in the same category as um the adult industry like oh. sex workers oh um so <laughs> we were only closed a month and a half wait <laughs> stop wait, 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 wait i thought you were gonna say oh we're in the same categories as sex workers so we had to close the witch longer because you know disease transmission and things like that you're like oh no we got we got a a fast pass to reopening yes we sure did so we were (laughs) down but not for long me and all the other girlies were back on top let me tell (laughs) you That's wild. Okay, so um I guess you so you resumed tattooing like maybe like around like eight June, I would say, maybe May, June. Yeah, around May. Okay. May and is a good estimate. You were doing consistent work though, because I remember for the longest time you were doing quite a frequent clients and you're putting a lot of like work on like Instagram and stuff. How long mm-hmm. did you um work at that, I guess it's not salon, tattoo parlor? Is that what they're called? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm so ignorant. Oh, how, how long did you work at the hair salon? <laughs> no, you're good. So I was at my first shop, I think a year. Okay. And then a shop in Houston was hiring, which had anime artists already working there, mm. which I thought, well, that's what I want to get into. I like anime. I want to tattoo anime. Um, so I interviewed there and they wanted me so i immediately packed all my shit up and left because that's how tattoo artists are like you just go you just go you just go with the wind yeah Mm -hmm. yep and i met two of my very close friends there renee and bridget and we soon discovered that this shop sucked ass it was horrible oh Oh. very disgusting and the owner was just a straight up asshole to everybody and we were done. So about three months later, we decided to open our own shop together. And so we just left. Once again, we just all packed our shit up and left and never looked back. Wait, that's I didn't wait, I did not actually did not know that you o- were part of opening like your own so were you a co owner? I guess it's, I guess maybe because At least the founder. really, uh, yeah, founder makes more sense because, uh, the place that we had opened together, uh, it's basically a building where you lease rooms gotcha. and my friend Renee was the owner of the lease. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. What was it called? But, uh, Okami Inc. Yeah. Is, is it still, is, is it, do they still work there? Is it still exist? Yes, it does. Oh my god, mm-hmm. love. Okay, so you worked there with your friends and um, started your own thing. And how long? Like, I guess you were. I guess because eventually you stopped tattooing. Mm-hmm. What What made you decide to stop pursuing being a tattoo artist and then swap over to what you're doing now? 
So I tattooed at Okami about two and a half years. And during the last year of that time, I started to have a desire to draw fan art and just things that I was very passionate about. Because when you are a tattoo artist, you basically draw whatever the client wants. And it's right. very rarely something that you want to draw. Um, wasn't getting that fulfillment yeah. that I was when I had first started tattooing. Gotcha. And I got way more fulfillment drawing all of these things that I was extremely passionate about. And towards the end of 2022, I decided, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to sign up for an art market, an anime themed art market and set up shop and see what happens. And it was actually very successful. I had a lot of customers buy my art, compliment it, just stuff like that. And, it, and I had that really strong fulfillment in my heart where I thought this feels really good. And I'm not getting this out of the art that I've been drawing for tattooing. Right. Um, so I spent many months after that researching like manufacturers, like for different products, just trying to expand and get my artwork on different little things um, that I could potentially sell at a convention. And so that's what I did on the side uh, next to my tattoo job. Gotcha. So you were still tattooing for, at Okami mm -hmm. Inc. while like on the side, maybe at like on the weekend or like at our different art markets, whatever, you would go and you'd have a booth with art that you were selling. Mm-hmm. And the more small events I did, uh, the more I got really into it and very passionate about it. And I really wanted to sell at a convention. So and then, oh, sorry. I was like, so then like, I guess what made you decide, okay, was there like a moment where you said, okay, I want to pursue being an artist full time and I'm going to stop tattooing or was it kind of just like a gradual transition of like, Oh, less hours, less hours. Like what, how'd that work? So it was like a balance, very slowly kind of, shifting uh -huh. to where I wanted to tattoo less and do art markets and go to conventions more. And the scale just kept tipping over the course of a year, gotcha. uh, over the course of 2023 to where I thought, well, I kind of just want to do artist alley full time. Yeah. And it was also kind of filling that itch of, wanting to be at conventions and just having a purpose for being there and enjoying it again, like I did with cosplay. Um, so in the middle of 2023, I let my coworkers know that I would no longer be tattooing and I would be pursuing just independent artwork. I, and, and we still I have a say... wonderful relationship as well. We still hang out. We, we do all kinds of things. We're besties. I'm so happy for um, that. I will say yeah. that like my... I think one regret I'll always live with, and I think I've told you this before too, is that I have been flirting with the idea of getting a tattoo for literally like my whole adult life. And I've always been too scared or too nervous or too uh, wishy-washy on like what I wanted. And I finally figured out what I want. And I, it's, I'm, okay, I'm pretty sure it's a Pikachu wearing a Hawaiian shirt holding a Mai Tai with like little sunglasses on his head. That's what I want. And I was like, you would be the, you would have been the perfect, you would be the perfect person to do this because of your style. But uh, then I, I, when I realized this and I was like getting more comfortable with the idea of having that, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm done. I was like, ah! I I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's all your fault. You're ruining my dreams. You're personally <laughs> crushing my dreams and my aspirations. I ruined your life. I did it intentionally, by the way. Do you still have that equipment, like the tattoo equipment, or no? So whenever I left, I just figured, you know, if I ever want to get back into tattooing, I can just buy it again. Mm -hmm. And I just left all of my shit with my coworkers. I'm like, y'all can just have whatever you want from what I have right here. Gotcha. And basically all of it got taken. So oh, at good. least it's being used. Yeah. And if you ever have your renaissance, um, I will be the first one to hit you up because I missed that boat once. I'm not missing it again. Maybe I'll keep my virgin Aww. body until you're ready to come back. 
you're so sweet, Zach. Also, <laughs> the way you described that Pikachu, that's so on brand for you. Mm. Like, I wouldn't expect anything different. It's perfect. Yeah, literally. <laughs> um, okay, I want to talk about Artist Alley. So, um, you started doing Artist Alley full time in 2023. What has been the best part about being an artist, doing Artist Alley full time? And then what conventions have you gone to since? So, honestly, I think my favorite thing about doing Artist Alley is being back in the convention scene and getting to discuss fandoms with whoever happens to be in my area. Because whenever I have uh, my artist booth, when I'm at my booth, I have all of my favorite fandoms hanging up on display and people will come and just start talking about, oh, I love this character so much. And here's all the reasons why I love them. And I'm obsessed with that. So I will just talk all day with people and then never see them again. Like, that's, <laughs> that's just what I love. Well, I'm sure, some, I'm sure some people you see, because like, I feel like when, at least I know when you go to a bunch of Texas conventions, uh, you'll see, especially if you travel to the conventions and you go to different cities, you'll see some of the similar artists again and again, and they'll make new work, which is always fun. Mm-hmm. But like, you'll get, a, you might not remember their name, but you'll remember their face and their art. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I've definitely had some return uh, customers or just passerby just say hi and ask how I'm doing. And, you know, I'll do the same, just a little quick catch up and then bye. See you at the next one. Maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah. <laughs> so have yeah. you mostly stayed in Texas or have you gone outside Texas yet to any conventions? So I have not been to any conventions outside of Texas. I would love to maybe a couple years from now when I've built a, a variety of fan art from different series. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the goal. I would absolutely love to go out of state at some point. I feel like you you might just have to like, I mean, I feel like obviously you know this better than I do because I don't know nothing about being an artist. I don't know nothing about being an artist, Allie. But I feel like you also have to kind of take that plunge like you did with your very first convention where you just went mm-hmm. by yourself not knowing. Um, and obviously like artist Alley communities are a little different because I know you all have your little like chats and you'll have your little like you know you know her and like all this there's like a, there's like a network of artists that can all kind of give input on like oh that convention's like really good or this one sucks or like yeah there's like all that going on so it's like not as oh absolutely uh, talk about that a little bit actually i want to know so like uh are there like have there do you have like a a secret like underground meeting location in the sewers? Do you have like carrier pigeons that take your messages? Like how do you how do you communicate with all of the artists and know what's what's what and where to go and where not to go? Okay, so I first of all I'm so happy that I was invited to this Discord channel um, because there's so much tea all the time. <laughs> um, But there is a huge Discord full of artists uh, that are from Texas, mostly. And there's all kinds of different chat channels about conventions, manufacturers, um, just just everything. Like, there's, Mm -hmm. like, hundreds of different chat logs that you can check out and peruse. Um, And there is definitely a channel where people can bitch and (laughs) complain about events, doing them dirty, and just which conventions to avoid. Yeah. And then on the flip side, there's a, a place where people can talk about the good conventions and why you should go to this convention and stuff like that. Yeah. No, I think it's important. That, I mean, I, cosplayers have that too. There's like Discord similarly where it's like, oh, these are the coming conventions and like these are the coming competitions and like these are the ones that like – you know, are reputable. These are the ones that maybe aren't so good that you shouldn't go to. So like it's, but it's good to know that like, if you were, when, not if, when you're ready to go and like go and like pursue an out-of-state convention for the first time, you have a network of resources available to make that decision easier. Yes, absolutely. And there's also the ability to room share, Mm. plan flights together, just stuff like that. The community is very welcoming and very kind. Yeah. It's just sometimes hard to get a table. <laughs> yes, it is. It is very hard. It is a fierce competition to get a table. Have you ever been to, I mean, okay, so there are different convention rules, right? Some of them only allow like original art. Some 
like are juried panels of like they review applications some are like random they just pick whoever out of the hat like what were some mm-hmm. of your experience have you had any of those experiences like what's like a crazy one if you have any that are like in terms of application processes so applications it's pretty straightforward um i'll basically troll all of the social media pages for this list of conventions that i'm interested in vending at uh look out for when they post that the apps are open and apply Um, but each one it's kind of different some will go through as a jury and very carefully select exactly what they want Um, others will just put all the names in a hat and do a lottery system that's what san japan does they do a lottery system (laughs) i didn't know that actually i don't think i ever knew wait that's crazy it is is very cruel um (laughs) Because they will have up to a thousand applicants as well. So, how many tables do they have? It, oh my gosh, I think 250. So, like, a, a three fourths of the people are not going to get in there. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. I know that artist alley is really big, but like, when you think about how many, how many people want to apply there, it's crazy. I mean, I just saw an artist alley map for AX and I was like, it's. It, it's i'll send it to you it's huge it's like baffling how big this map is i mean maybe in a few years i'll see you there no actually who knows but (laughs) um no so that's that's wild so the san japan's a lottery um there's like juried applications are there any like ones that offer like um loyalty i don't know the right way to say that like uh if you've been the year before you have like a like a leg up on going back Yes, yeah, so pretty much all the conventions do that, or at least they state they do in whenever you fill out the application. But the most I've seen that actually happen was has been for Onicon. Oh. Because at the end of the convention, they basically announce, hey, if you want to come back next year, come and pay your deposit. So oh. simple as. That's I easy. I kind of like that. Yeah. I kind of like that. Yeah, like it gives like a like a priority if you've already been at the show to like go back and like that's is Onicon the only one that you've been to that that's like that or? Yes, actually, that's the only one I've been to so far that does it that way. It's interesting. Um, but earlier you mentioned what conventions I've been an artist in the artist alley for. Yeah, and so far I've done Comic Palooza, San Japan, DreamCon, Anime Houston, Anime Frontier, OniCon, and a bunch of smaller conventions. No WeebCon. But I can't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, Chick Fil A sauce. <laughs> no, <laughs> no WeebCon. Well, I attended WeebCon last year for fun. You did. And I decided I am never coming back here. <laughs> not as an artist, not as an attendee, not no. as a custodian. No. Oh, my gosh. Um, what was your favorite, uh, for, not for any specific reason, but like, what was just your general favorite convention to be an artist at? So I really like being at Comic Palooza because they always have really cool guests. Mm-hmm. Like last year, um, I got to meet Anthony Starr from The Boys. I have oh, a huge yeah. crush on him. Um, so that was super cool. And basically, I was working my booth and I told the person I was sharing with, hey, I'm going to go take this photograph real quick. I'll be back in an hour. So I did that. And then I came back to sell stuff again. But it was really exciting. I love. Uh, yeah, I can vouch that Comic Palooza does have the best guests because, you know, last year the cosplay guests were pretty good. <gasps> they if were I very say good. so myself. Um, they were very well- talented. <laughs> uh, and also, of, of course, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the shade. No, but, I'm kidding. Um, of course, San Japan. Oh, I mean, yeah. That's my first love. So going back to San Japan for any reason is always good. Are you going this year again? Or do you know yet? I don't know yet, but I've decided whether I get in Artist Alley or not, I'm definitely going. Hell yeah. I'll see you there then. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your least favorite um, convention to be an artist at for no particular reason? Um... So there was one <laughs> small market I had signed up for, an anime themed market. And this took place in Dallas October of last year. And when I 
showed up. Uh, mind you, I drove all the way from Houston and got a hotel room in Dallas for this. Um, I showed up to set up, and the market was in an abandoned mall <laughs> inside of Victoria's Secret. Stop it. <laughs> this isn't real. This isn't real. <laughs> Do you know where in Dallas? Like, what area? Oh, shit. I'm going to be honest. I have no idea. Maybe Louisville? Louisville? Okay. Yeah. That's hilarious. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> an abandoned Victoria of doing an abandoned mall, Victoria's Secret. So wait, were the lights on? Was there was there plumbing? So <laughs> <laughs> there there was plumbing and the lights were on. It's mostly been converted into um a food a place. Okay. Ugh. Okay, let me start over. <laughs> so this abandoned mall has been converted into a place for people to eat at. So pretty much the only thing that's open is the food court. Okay, so it's a, it's an old mall food food court and like no shops. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I guess I'm assuming that this mall they lease out the empty stores for things like this. And how did you know it was, it was Victoria's Secret? Oh, it had all the pinstripes on the wall still. <laughs> Yeah, so um, all of the furniture and store fixtures that the lingerie go in were still there. But there was no lingerie. Just, like, the pink pinstripes and all the fixtures. Oh, my God. Wait, so you were just all the... They had, like, what, fold-out tables just set up in this, like, Victoria's Secret? Why? Why? why Victoria, how many people were there? How many artists were there? I would say probably 40. There were a okay. lot. There in this were a one lot. Victoria's Secret? Yes, we were wall to wall. Were there a lot of people? I don't. So it was pretty much a ghost town. I would say at most, maybe like 50 people walked through very briefly. Oh my God. I mean, I guess what else do you expect when you're in an abandoned Victoria's Secret in a mall that yes. no one knows about? And the best part is that at one point the fire alarm started going off. And people started to run out of Victoria's <laughs> Secret. <laughs> and I felt so fucking done that I sat there. <laughs> I didn't give a fuck if I died in that moment. <laughs> oh my god. That's so funny. It's so sad. Wait, how, was the table expensive? Or was it like cheap at least? Oh, it was cheap, thankfully. Okay. But, um, I mean, you still drove all the way from Houston. Yes. So, um, I was in a net loss for that one, for sure. <laughs> but very shortly after the fire alarm incident, I just, I just packed it up. I'm like, I can't take this shit no more. Done. Was, was that like, was that at least most way through the day or was it like halfway through? It was <laughs> halfway through. I, I don't think I would be here today if I had stayed for the whole thing, Zach. I'm being it honest. Would've, it would have driven you to ruin and madness. <laughs> um, okay, that's hilarious. Oh my god, I'm dying. Uh, question, hot topic. Uh, AI art in the artist alley. Um, have you seen it? And what are your thoughts? Because I don't, I think I've heard, I've heard about it, obviously, but I don't think I've ever seen it myself. So... I have seen some things in Artist Alley that look very suspiciously like AI. Um, and these conventions in their contracts now, they have a blurb about AI art not being allowed mm. at all. Very okay. strict. If you're caught with AI art, you're going to get kicked out. Um, but with that being said, um, I haven't seen any booths just filled with AI art, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there's maybe been a one piece where you look at it and you think, hmm, that looks a little different mm -hmm. from the rest of the art style on display. How likely is it that, that like, the artist... Funky. Yeah, how, but I, I think your eye would be a lot more um, adept to, to detect that than I would probably, but how, I guess why wouldn't artists have like one piece of AI art and then everything else be like original? God, I have no idea. I think it's more so like the booths where you see um, a lot of hyper realism back to back to back, 
But mm. you'll notice little things like strands of hair blending into skin or like the hands looking a little funky. Uh, uh, there's just really tiny little things that you can see where you think, hmm, that doesn't look right. It looks a little suspicious. And I imagine like the more reputable like conventions are the ones that are probably vetting out the AI artists and like enforcing that more so than the ones that like it's a free for all. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah, so during the application, they do want to see pictures of your artwork and your booth setup. So they're probably looking for it. Yeah. At least I, I hope I'll, so. Yeah. I think that like also generally when I'm in artist alleys, I'm only looking for uh, little yellow rats. Um, so rat. yeah, I think that generally my, uh, my field of view of what I'm looking for is probably not including AI Pikachus, although who knows maybe. Um, all right. Uh, I want to go to the guest question, or, yeah, question for you, for our guest by an audience member. Um, it's actually on my phone, so let me pull it up real quick. Ooh, um, I feel so special. Oh, my God, don't. I just didn't want to print it out. <laughs> no, people are actually uh, using the Square, not Square, yeah, the Squarespace, our website. Um, they're using our website submission to submit questions, and if you have a question, you can actually go to cosplaycrunch.com and submit a question there, which is what this person did. So I'm going to read it. Um, Hi, I really, really love your podcast. It was so much fun to listen to. Thank you, by the way. I wanted to ask a question for an upcoming guest. What would you tell cosplayers looking to compete in a craftsmanship contest for the first time? I'm looking to try my first contest, and I was curious what sorts of things judges look for and what to focus on when making your cosplay for a competition. Thank you. Um, so we're going to hearken it back to pre COVID for you. And mm-hmm. I think that you are more than qualified to answer this question, even though you have made costumes in a few years because of how many competitions you did and the level of work that you did, which was truly stunning. Um, yeah. What would your advice be for people that are looking to enter their first contest and just in general for people looking to compete? Um, I guess in this context, it's, assuming a novice because it's their first cost contest but yeah i guess what would you what was some advice beef of yours so something that i really enjoyed doing when i entered cosplay contests was creating a mini portfolio filled with progress pictures and even samples of the materials that you used and passing that over to the judges so they can actually see all of the work that went into it and all the different materials and steps that you took. It just brings a a sort of authenticity that, yes, I did make this Mm -hmm. and here's all my progress. Because sometimes um, I've judged a couple of contests uh, where it was obvious that the person who entered did not make their cosplay and Mm -hmm. they were trying to pass it off that they had made it right um so just having that portfolio is just extra proof that yes did this and i'm proud of it here you yeah, go so having a build book because i think um build books and or portfolios in general at the novice level are not common not as common mm-hmm. i think maybe now in 2024 they're more common than they were before but in general i think that most people that are entering novice have never done a contest before and most of those people um don't even know that that's something that you can or should bring um mm-hmm. and i think that at master's level most people do bring a build book because it's mm-hmm. kind of like you just said it's the it shows all the works in progress, the techniques, the materials. It show, demonstrates that you actually made the thing and you know what you're talking about. And it leaves something with the judges to remember you by after you've left the room. Absolutely. Because the times that I did judge contests, when someone would show me and let me hold on to their their progress book until the end of the, the contest was over, it left a very good impression and yeah. it made me consider them just slightly more just because there is definitive proof that yes they worked very hard on this. Yeah, and I'll so also add Yeah. Yeah, I'll also I'll, I'll add um with those with those portfolios with those build books keep 
your writing to a minimum and add lots of pictures because Mm -hmm. ultimately the judges are going through the bill books so quickly that they really just want to see pictures to demonstrate what you're doing. And if text helps to explain what that is, then add it. But like paragraphs of text are not usually going to be helpful because there's so much to look through, not just in your build book, but in all the other like 60, 70 plus contestants build books that we're not going to be sitting there reading it like it's like a diary. It's going to be a quick flip through to like see like what's happening, not necessarily I'm reading this word for word, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very picture focused. And really, if you're posting pictures of what you're working on, uh, someone who's experienced at craftsmanship, like a judge, they'll look at that picture and most of the time they'll know exactly what that picture is. They know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. I think so too. Also what I'll do, a tip for people, I will, I don't know if anyone does this, but I document most of my builds and Instagram highlights just because it's kind of fun to be able to like go back and see all of the different, like all the things you did for a costume. And what I've done in the past is I've actually just gone and like downloaded pictures from Instagram with like the text over the picture as build book images. And it looks kind of jank because there's all these different fonts But like, also it's easy because it's already there documented on an Instagram, just download them and put them on paper and then print them out. No, that sounds really smart, actually, Zach. No, literally. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a piece of art, you know, mm -hmm. as long as you just have the pictures, that's all you need. My build book uh, for a contest I did last year was literally the most ratchet piece. It was like it was like twenty pieces of printer paper, half ink was empty, um, stapled together, wrinkled, and like just Instagram like highlights just plopped on there with no context, and it was great. It it worked perfect. So I think it doesn't need to be fancy. Just like bring something is what I would say in terms of like a, a build book and get the point across without you know, writing too much. And, oh, and I would say generally as a guide, not, this is not Bible or anything like that, but like the running rule generally is like, if you can keep your build book to about 10 to 12 pages per human being that's entering, uh, then that's best. And I say that because like, if you're in a group, you might have two costumes. So like, like anywhere from like 18 to 20 pages might be more appropriate. Um, but yeah, I would say like, try to keep it between 10 to 12 pages per costume per person that's like entering the contest. Don't make it like too long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's good advice. Um, yeah, I, I remember I've seen some build books that were like 50 or 60 pages for one person. Oh, and wow. And they've literally, yeah, it, they've literally like taken like code that they've written and like dumped it into a build book. And then like to prove they coded it or what coded like the electronics, um but that's a lot (laughs) that is a little overkill i would say (laughs) but they were very passionate about it obviously so (laughs) and that's what matters at the end of the day um okay well we're gonna wrap up i'm gonna read the little outro and i'm gonna come to you at the end um but Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for listening, for joining another episode of the Cosplay Crunch. If you'd like to ask a question to one of our guests, please email us at cosplaycrunchpod at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Cosplay Crunch Podcast for the latest podcast news and announcements, as well as on cosplaycrunch.com and on YouTube at the Cosplay Crunch Podcast. If you want to watch the videos, because they're pretty fun, and sometimes there's cameo appearances in the background from my pets, including my boyfriend. Um, do you have any parting words for our listeners, Lisa? And where can they find you on social media? Well, you can find me on Instagram at uh, Kadia Kawaii, K-A-D-I-A-A-K-A-W-A-I-I. And that's basically my spell. only social. <laughs> Come on, I've had spelling. to say it so many times <laughs> at cons. I'm, I'm very good at it now. Um, <laughs> but honestly, thank you so much for having me on, Zach. Like, I've really enjoyed listening to all your podcast episodes so far. And just being on here fills me with joy. 
I'm so glad. It's like a little stamp. It's kind of fun. It's kind of like a little like for me, it's kind of like I'm collecting like trading cards almost. <laughs> it's like every time I get to have the little like icon square with the little guest image in the middle, it's so fun. And I'm like, oh, this is so good. And like uh, it just adds to like the family, if you will, of like all of the, the people. So no, it's really fun. I'm really happy you got to do this and thank you so much. Um I, yeah, it was great catching up and also learning more about the whole journey that you had because it's kind of interesting how many different ups and downs and like, you know, all the different genres, if you will, of your life. So, yeah. Thanks. I just hope it's interesting for your listeners. Oh, you know, even if it's not, I don't care because I was interested. Um, <laughs> oh, lastly, also, nice. uh, yeah, please rate us on podcast um, on Spotify, on Apple, on the mobile app. You can rate the podcast. That would be great. It'll recommend more people. And we love new people. And if you didn't like the podcast, um, then go to Walmart and complain about it. Um, but yeah, until next time, thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs> The Cosplay Crunch Podcast is hosted by Zavage Cosplay, with post-production also by Zavage Cosplay. Original theme music by Katie Fairbanks. Logo and graphic design by Owl and Coffee.